name is Kristen Curry Greenwood and I'm the department chair in the Department of Physical Therapy, Movement and Rehabilitation Sciences here at Northeastern University. It's my great pleasure to be moderating this session today entitled A View from the Front well, Lines of Post-COVID Rehabilitation. As we know, the world of rehabilitation for patients that have been affected by COVID is still dealing with many unknown questions. While we're becoming more wise every day on the science of COVID-19, we are aware that there are so many long-term effects that we have yet to realize, including patients having neurological dysfunction, the effect on children from being quarantined in isolation and out of school systems, the effect on our practice of rehabilitation, and the effect on patient health and outcomes in the long term. Today, we're going to start addressing some of those questions through the mindset of women leaders who are dealing with these challenges every single day. We're going to invite the audience to ask thoughtful questions, and we are going to allow plenty of time for responses from our panels. At this time, I'm gonna turn it back over to my colleague, Crosby, to give us some information on how the moderated session will run today. Thanks so much, Kristen. Welcome, everybody. As we settle in, we just want to share a few best practices and notes for the event. We are recording this, and the recording will be circulated afterwards. To assist us with taking attendance, we ask that you please try to have your first and last name listed in the participants window. If you've joined from another device, such as a family member's iPhone or iPad, you may need to rename yourself. I'll post instructions in the chat, and if you can't access this feature for whatever reason, you're welcome to message me privately in the chat window with your name. If you join with, from your phone, um, you obviously can't rename yourself, which is totally fine. We'll try to capture you based on registration. To raise a question or comment during the presentation, please use the chat window. You can type your question or comment there at any time, and we'll address it in the Q&A portion in the second half of the event. When your question or comment is raised, you're welcome to unmute yourself at that time if you'd like to add on. And as a courtesy, please remain muted unless it is your time to speak. You're welcome to leave your webcam on for the duration. It'd be great to see everybody's faces. However, you do not need to. And with that, I will turn it back to Kristen and our presenters. Thank you, Crosby. At this time, I'm going to ask our three panelists to introduce themselves. So first, I'll call on Dr. Kelly Bedoni. Hi, everyone. I am Dr. Kelly Bedoni, and I'm an outpatient orthopedic physical therapist. I am the founder and owner of a cash-based uh, physical therapy company, uh, K. Bedoni Physical Therapy, uh, as well as a co-founder of Fitpartum, which is a company based on helping pregnant and postpartum women uh, return to exercise. Uh, my specialty is blending orthopedics with pregnancy and postpartum safe return to physical therapy and exercise. I'm a Northeastern alum. I'm actually a triple Husky. And I did my bachelor's uh, in 1998 in physical therapy, master's degree, and most recently my doctorate. Thank you, Kelly. Now I will ask Dr. Zimmerman to introduce yourself, please. Hello, thank you so much for inviting me to join this panel today. Um, and it is an honor to be here. As uh, was said, my name is Dr. Emily Zimmerman, and I'm an Associate Professor in Communication Sciences and Disorders here at Northeastern. My area of expertise is in speech, uh, speech development, how, how it relates to sucking and feeding development. Um, we examine these behaviors in the Speech and Neurodevelopment Lab, which I'm a director of. Um, so really my focus as a faculty member is on infant development and how it interacts with um, early oral motor behaviors and subsequent development. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, Dr. Kristen Dunn. Hi, I'm Kristen Dunn. I am a Husky alum from 2015, and I'm currently an inpatient physical therapist at Boston Medical Center, where I um, specialize in typically neurologic rehab, but we are so always on a different floor, but thank you very much for including me. Thank you, Kristen. So let's get started and get right into it with some questions we've already kind of received. So, so first, and I'm going to ask this one of Kelly first, um, you know, as your, as your practice transforms healthcare, and now you have this pandemic of COVID, I'd really like to know what, it, what's disrupted you? What, what have you encountered and, and what can you tell us about your story as you're leading? 
Sure. I mean, my main focus is outpatient orthopedics, and I'm also mobile in my practice. Um, so I go to people's homes. So obviously that when we're shut down in a pandemic, that's very difficult. And, you know, my main source is hands-on PT. And March 15th, I was, you know, doing hands-on PT. March 16th, I wasn't because, you know, in our state, Governor Baker, you know, shut us down. And, you know, while I was considered essential, I had to make the decisions for my family that that risk reward part wasn't what I, you know, felt I wanted to do. So we moved to telehealth. I had to adapt my outpatient um, practice to more of a telehealth. Um, and it gave me a different perspective on how I delivered physical therapy, because while I had done some in-person, I'm sorry, some um, some telehealth and some clinic check-ins with people who went away to college or moved away and didn't want to travel to me. It wasn't a formal um, sort of business. So my hands are my bread and butter. And what I had to then change my perspective was that, okay, well, my brain is driving these hands, my brain, you know, in that bread and butter. So I had to shift my, my mental focus of the stressful and negative, you know, how, how am I going to get somebody better without using my hands to more of a positive, how do I educate that patient now to be more resilient, to guide themselves through their treatment and you know, realize that if their signs and symptoms come back, how to manage that in the future. And I felt that was a, a good building block for me. And it was kind of a kick in the pants to say, hey, yeah, that works. You know, by delivering quote, in-person PT through a remote concept, it was, you know, it helped me get through that time right there because I love the in, you know, the, the in-person physical therapy, but it was a nice way to deliver it. And the virtual intervention kind of solidified my point that we can educate patients to help themselves, which was nice. You know, on the business aspect, um, one of the biggest things is we had to change, you know, everybody gets a temperature check, you know, and that everybody, we, we educate our people on, um, signs and symptoms of COVID, and we do a self-attestation. And I think we need to start thinking about that as a perspective a year from now. Are we still going to be doing that? And one thing that I thought about is, you know, in the past, before COVID, I think everybody has gone to work sick. I think everybody has sent their kids to school sick. I mean, I've, I've been the one that dosed the Tylenol and tried to play beat the clock, you know, of, of how do I get these patients in before I get the school nurse? And I think if we change that to, you know, consider the public health format versus the financial piece of, okay, we might be losing some stuff on that end, but as a public health consideration, we're all in this together. So offering remote visits or just telling somebody, hey, today's not your day. You know, I, I don't want you to come in, you know, that we can offer physical therapy in a way that doesn't have to be in person and we can keep everybody safe because we all, you know, we're in this together and the ramifications of educating people on COVID and saying, okay, you know, it doesn't just affect you. It doesn't just affect me. It affects your family, my family, everyone. I, I think, especially in outpatient healthcare, that's a, a big thing because there is a financial piece to it, but you know, we all are in this together. Mm -hmm. Kelly, that it's really interesting, especially how you kind of you know pivoted on a dime, right? You went from something that was uh, you know not really thought about, right, hands-on care in a virtual environment, to being you know an expert at it, and you know because you had to be. Uh, Emily, I'm going to ask you to weigh in here. You know, knowing that research stopped as well, really on a dime, and um, you know how, how is this impacting you in your professional arena? Yeah, so I think um, first it's kind of a good way to start by describing kind of what I even do in a week, right? So as a professor, I have this delicate balance between juggling teaching, service-related activities, and my research. So as I said, I'm a director of a research lab on campus that works with mothers and infants. So I would say that COVID-19 has completely disrupted my profession as an academic as well as greatly affected my field of speech language pathology. And I'd like to talk more about these two aspects in more detail. So as an academic, you know, there was that really quick adjustment to online everything. So we had online teaching, we had, um, you know, again, as Kelly said, really the bread and butter of our job as a, prof 
as professors is to be engaging with our students. So all of that engagement turned virtual. Um, and then we also had all of our service related activities turn virtual. I had several conferences that were, um, you know, I was meant to leave the, in the week or two after everything was shut down and present research findings that we, of course, been working on for a really long time. Um, and all of those also went virtual. So some, some either were canceled or you did recordings um, from a Zoom format. Um, so, but for the field of speech language pathology, COVID-19 has, has had some really tremendous effects and Kelly has spoken to some of them. Um, but I'd like to point out that from a developmental perspective, there's been a huge paucity on the ability to evaluate young children for speech language, hearing and feeding difficulties. So while those who were receiving services um, kind of really nicely transitioned to a more telehealth approach, you know, we, we kind of lacked initially that ability to evaluate, which is again, key. Um, and telehealth, while, is, while it is extremely effective, also comes with its challenges. And these include access to internet, knowledge of technology, so for that more senior population. And then you also have, therapists working with young children and trying to keep their attention via Zoom, which is challenging. Um, in terms of rehabilitation, I think it's really important to note and understand that the typical sequence of rehabilitation services that would have otherwise been provided were often halted during the pandemic. So if you went in to the ICU with a stroke or, you know, had some sort of medical event, you know, the typical rehab sequence was often transitioned at a faster rate or put via telehealth. Um, and we also know that individual, individuals who's been, who've been hospitalized or placed on a ventilator secondary to COVID-19 will experience respiratory, voice, and swallowing difficulties. We know that the neurological effects, including cognitive changes, are also being recorded in COVID-19 survivors. And many of these deficits likely will have a persistent impact on communication and swallowing function. And the extent and the range of these deficits is continuing to become known throughout the pandemic. Emily, you remind me of this, this parallel between yourself and Kelly of, uh, I'm thinking of people that I know, other pregnant women out there, right? That are about to have children. They're worried about their children having not the access to care, the, the postnatal care, the, the postpartum care of, of women. What, what would you or Kelly say, and then we'll move on to Kristen, to those women that are nervous? You know, they're, they're, they're nervous about having children in this environment right now. I mean, I would say that, you know, it, I think we're all nervous. You know, I think, I think it's a nervous time for anyone, but I think just kind of switching the mind frame to, from nervousness to, to we can do this safely. You know, you can have your baby in a healthy way and you can still get the medical care you need. But what I think is um, problematic is there is starting to become a group of people who aren't, you know, going for their regular checkups and doing these things that are so important. For example, oral hygiene. Um, you're not, the kid, parents aren't taking their young kids to their dental appointments or their yearly checkups. So, you know, I can't, I think we can't let fear drive us away from the medical help that we need. But I think, you know, just switching the mindset that we can be safe and healthy uh, with our young children. Kelly, do you have anything to add? I think you really summarized that really well, where if we can give these women options and safe options and let them know and educate them that there are ways to do this and validate that their, their fears but not feed into them, absolutely. That, that's a way to get them to feel more in control of the situation that they really don't have any control on. Thank you. That's wonderful advice from both of you. Let's transition now to Kristen Dunn. So Kristen Dunn, as, as you were saying in the introduction, you're at Boston Medical Center. You're the lead physical therapist on the pandemic team. Uh, that's a little bit different than working uh, with patients uh, primarily in the neurological arena as you've been doing. So talk us through what, what's going on in your arena right now. What, what can you share? So right now, things have calmed down, thankfully, but um, I would say in March, it was a little different. Uh, as kind of we saw as a nation, the COVID-19 virus getting closer and closer to the U.S., uh, my boss started putting together a team uh, of, first it was myself and an occupational therapist named R Renee Redfern, who was absolutely wonderful. And we had to come up with a completely different protocol. 
uh, we were looking at this virus and we would have daily meetings with uh, the occupational therapist, myself and our, our supervisor, trying to figure everything out. Uh, we, everything we knew about respiratory illnesses, this virus presented very differently. So we really started doing our job in a completely different way. Uh, we had to learn on the fly every day. Every day was a new day. We would come and say, oh, what did you see with this patient? I saw something different. This worked for me. This didn't work for me. And when you think about respiratory illnesses as a physical therapist, you're, you're thinking, okay, we got to get the patient up. We got to get the patient upright. It'll help with their kind of pulmonary hygiene and getting everything out of their lungs. But as more and more research about the virus came out, we were realizing that it, it wasn't kind of an obstructive uh, or anything building up necessarily in the lungs, but more that there was scarring. And so the alveoli were being propped open. So we were calling these people happy hypoxics because they looked great. And then you get them on the monitor and their sats were in the 70s. So it was very scary. Uh, and being a, a relatively young therapist, I've been out of school now for five years. It was, it was hard. Um, I had to really learn how to be a leader in a way that I never really saw myself as. Um, I had to build confidence because as we had to, we had more and more patients coming in, we needed a bigger team. So every time a new therapist came on, I, I was training and teaching them what I was learning, which as much as, I mean, I, I've, I'm a part-time faculty member at Northeastern, so I, I'm pretty comfortable with teaching, but being a leader amongst colleagues that were more experienced than I was, was a challenge. And so I really had to, to grow into my own confidence and realize that Right now, we needed to be a team, and it was it was scary, but things we, we figured it out, and we worked as a team to create protocols and exercise programs, and not as we are, we are very hands on, not in the same way that that Kelly and Emily are in the acute care setting, but initially we we were concerned about PPE. We did not know if we would have enough, and we were hearing stories from around the world of people. I mean, you, everyone saw the pictures of healthcare providers and trash bags and, and everything like that. So we were, we were trying to limit how many consults were coming in. So we had to come up with a way for, to decrease the amount of consults that were coming in um, to conserve PPE while also providing the care that patients needed. So we would have consults that were almost non-contact consults where we were having phone calls with the patient. What are the things that you're going through? What are some teaching patients how to self-prone if they were able to? We came up with, um, exercise programs for patients based on their activity level that we would speak with the nurses and based on the fact that they needed help getting to the bathroom or they were able to roll independently get do a sit to stand independently we had different grades of exercise programs that we could give to the patient that they could perform safely without using unnecessary ppe so it went from oh, I'm just I just want to interrupt you there for a second because I think you're you're you said something a little while ago that I think um I'm impressed I'm so impressed with with your demeanor with Kelly and Emily's as as emulating this we've got this right you're not looking like you're at this shock of the front lines right now and so as, I just want to go back to you you talked about you graduated 5 years ago right meaning 12 years ago you were likely in high school is it might be a fair statement right what does that feel like to like, what have you relied on personally through your own coping, your own resiliency to say, here I am leading a pandemic team in a hot spot across the country of one of the leaders of physical therapy, maybe in the globe. What does that feel like? So actually, I, it may have been you. Uh, a professor when I was in school said, if you choose to work in healthcare, especially the acute care setting, patients are going to come to you at their worst. So you need to be at your best. So of course I was terrified. There were many times that I almost passed out in the ICU. I think the embarrassment of knowing I would open my eyes surrounded by a bunch of doctors that I work with uh, kept me upright sometimes, but I knew that I was going home. I was, I was scared. I was scared of bringing it home to my family, but it, I just knew that this is what we had to do. I mean, as a I kept saying to friends and family that my job is hard, but this is just a little harder. And it, there was no choice but to move forward. I mean, we were given the choice at, at BMC to um, voluntarily furlough, but very few of our coworkers did because we work in the hospital setting, we work in healthcare, and 
it just is, it kind of, it was what it was. And it, that's not a really good answer necessarily, but we just, you had to keep your head down and take it day by day. I did a lot of cooking. I wish I could say that I did more exercise for a coping strategy, but I was typically asleep on my couch by 6.30 or 7 at night. But um, I did a lot of coping or cooking. I, uh, I talked to my friends and family. I, I kind of, I'm a big advocate for mental health support. So I had a therapist on speed dial if I needed one. And you just had to keep your head down and keep going because there was no other choice. And Patients were coming in and they were they were just as scared as I was and more scared because I'm familiar with the health healthcare system. A lot of our patients are not, especially at Boston Medical Center. A lot of our patients are are of lower socioeconomic statuses as a, as we are a safety net hospital. So these patients, a whole family was in the hospital at once, and we had a mom in the ICU and a child and uh, or their their daughter in, on a different floor and. The daughter is typically taking care of the mother. And so we really had to just think about get outside of yourself and you just put your head down and you're, you're there to help. There is no other choice. Yeah, really inspiring words, you know, not only to us listening, but also to all of our students, right? You know, we emulate that, you know, let you do what needs to be done. That's what we do in Vube and in healthcare. I want to circle back, bring Kelly into this a little bit. So Kelly, you've been out in practice a little bit longer than Kristen has. Um, and again, talk to me about your research. Resilience. Your, you know, what what have you done professionally to um, to continue to lead? Sure. I mean, some of the things that um, we said before, like self care, and then establishing boundaries. So I was uh, the director, the co director of three clinics earlier on in my career, and um, I was put in a leadership position midway through. That you know, one day my director was there, and one day she wasn't. So. You know, my coworker, who's also a Northeastern alum, were thrust into this role of you have to do everything from being a treating therapist to payroll to supplies to laundry to ordering. And, you know, it, it got really tough because we were treating therapists with, a you know, 100% caseload and then had this on top. So we realized there's always work to be done. And when you thought that you got a break, there really wasn't because something else would come in. And... I started to burn out and that was really hard because it was a company and a job that I really, really loved. So what I found is that I had to set boundaries and those boundaries are, you know, when I was treating, I was treating and, and unless the clinic's on fire, don't interrupt me. <laughs> and when I was on admin time, that door was shut and I had to get that stuff done. And the hardest part was saying no. And I find that's a really hard word to say as a woman because, you know, we're generally people pleasers and we want to, you know, be successful and, you know, do everything we can. So when this pandemic hit and now on March 15th, I was treating and March 16th, I was not, I immediately went to be an unemployed sole proprietor business owner trying to survive, trying to make my business survive with all the connections I had made. Uh, made. And then I also became not just a, an unemployed business owner, but I have three children. So I became the math teacher, the history teacher, <laughs> the tech support, because inevitably the Wi-Fi would go down. And if anyone knows me, that's just setting up for failure. <laughs> um, and I became a chef. I mean, for three boys, I prepared three meals a day. It was it was hard and I started to recognize those signs of burnout that I had when I was you know, in PT in the clinic setting. And so I realized I had to set boundaries. And if you can do that and say, okay, this was the time I was gonna work on my business. And for that time, the kids were set up. And then when I was helping to educate my kids, I put away the business side because there is always something to do. And that kind of leads into self-care where I had to find something for myself every day so that I wouldn't burn out. And, and whether that's meditating for five minutes for yourself, you know, setting a workout, cooking, which is definitely not mine anymore. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's something that you have to do to, to maintain some of that control over a situation that you really don't have any control about. With metrics coming out daily, we don't. I mean, even think about school. Every community has a different outlook right now about hybrid remote and we just have to keep going and figure out what works for us. Great. That's really inspiring. I can't imagine cooking that many meals for <laughs> all of the time. 
Emily, let's transition to you. So Emily, you're, you're an associate professor, you have tenure, you have assistant professors, students looking up to you, aspiring to be you, kind of, you know, crushing that glass ceiling a little bit. So, so talk to me about what you've relied on for your personal and professional resilience strategies at this time. Yeah, so I think, first of all, in the field of rehab, I think in general, all of us are extremely adaptable. It's kind of part of our nature. Um, I would say as academics, I think we're constantly changing course. So in science, sometimes your hypotheses don't work out and you need to tell a different story. Um, and I would also say that in the career of science, it comes with a lot of rejection and a lot of periods of reflection. And you know, maybe you didn't get that big grant or your latest manuscript that you've been working years on was rejected. And over time for me, this has really created a personal and persistent drive and has really installed a, a nature of never giving up. So for me, I'm the type of person in the face of rejection, I tend to get a little bit more amplified. I want to go higher or do better. Um, but I think the tenure process has really kind of shed some light for me going through this pandemic. So, you know, I want when I was going through the tenure process, my approach was really to kind of keep my drive, keep my perseverance, keep my passion. And as Kelly said, set healthy boundaries. So, you know, knowing I also have two young children who are four and seven who rely on me um, to be their mother. Uh, so, you know, I think also realizing going through the tenure process, you know, I couldn't control the tenure result, but I could control those things I could control. And with this pandemic, I can't control how or when it will end, but I'm going to work hard. I'm going to follow my passion. I'm going to persevere through the daily ups and downs and even hourly ups and downs, mm -hmm. and also set those appropriate boundaries so that I can take care of myself and my family. Um, and I would like to say too that the, the delicate balance that I described in my role as a professor was heavily reliant on full childcare. So, you know, as, Kelly said, cooking all these meals and doing all of these things, you know, this wasn't always part of uh, the daily plan. <laughs> yes, my children did eat, don't worry. Um, but, you know, I think, um, I know that I'm not alone and I know that many people are sharing their stories of taking care of their young children or their elderly parents during this time. But I do want to point out that women tend to be more likely affected by this. And it's more particularly as far as, um, you know, letting their research take a back burner. And this is probably paralleled by the fact that women tend to do more service work in academia than men. And I think that it's also important to know that these disparities are even more abundant for women of color. So I think as we approach, you know, the next few years of our lives, we must be kind and understanding and realize that everyone right now is doing the best they can, but everyone is doing it from very different lenses and very different backgrounds. Yeah, that's really, really strong advice. And, and I think the parallel to what goes on with women uh, in a non-COVID environment is important for us to keep in mind and understand as we go forward. Thank you for sharing that. I, I, Kristen, I'm going to circle back to you now. Um, transitioning a little bit, we, we do know, based on the science in our society, we will eventually get to a time that we will consider post-COVID. It may not be the post-COVID that we imagined at the beginning, but we do know we'll get there. And I wonder, are there lessons learned or things that you would take away from this time that you may want to keep? Is there, is the, has the COVID pandemic made a, made a positive out of anything in your professional journey? I, I think so. I, it's, I tend to kind of look at life frequently through rose colored glasses a little bit, but I think I learned a lot. I, I, as we were kind of just, we've discussed many times, if you, uh, Kelly put it perfectly kind of in our before, if you, you're done learning, you're done in this profession. I learned so much and I learned about myself, how, how kind of strong I can be. And uh, I also learned that I have a great support system that I was able to reach out to. And um, the strength that I found was actually asking for help, which uh, that's another thing I feel like as women, we, we tend to try and be like, nope, I got it. I can handle this by myself. But I found that my true strength was when I would go to my, my supervisor or my family and say, you know what, I need help right now. It's too much. And I need a little extra TLC. Um, I, I think that it was very interesting and a very unique experience to be able to learn about a novel virus as it was happening. I, I hope that this is a once in a lifetime opportunity, <laughs> to be quite honest, because 
I, I was pretty comfortable treating a typical respiratory illness, but this was obviously very new. Um, and I think we also learned as a profession, not necessarily only in the acute care setting, but as Kelly and Emily said, telehealth is, it might, it probably is the way of the future. I, I mean, people's lives are very busy and I, I'm hopeful that the future of, of physical therapy or rehab in general includes a lot more telehealth because I think it gave opportunities for people who normally can't get the physical therapy, whether it's a perceived or actual lack of time where I don't have time to go into the clinic. I know myself, I, I mess up my back and I'm like, no, I'm too busy. I'm not going to go into the clinic. I'll, obviously, I'm a physical therapist, so it's a little easier to fix it myself. But I think that telehealth is is going to give our our society more access to, to healthcare. I do think another thing, working in a health safety net hospital, we work with a lot of patients who their socioeconomic status affects their healthcare, whether it's their interaction with the healthcare system or their access to the healthcare system. And I'm hopeful that the, the, the disparities that were, were found in healthcare uh, that we uh, most of us already knew about but now have been highlighted, it, it kind of changes how we look at how much socioeconomic status affects health status. And it's something as healthcare providers we think about very frequently. But when we were talking about discharges during COVID, in order to safely discharge someone home, they had to be able to self-isolate. And that includes their own bedroom with no one else in it. That includes a, a separate bathroom using different utensils to, to prevent spread. And if you think of the gross majority of the population, especially in the city of Boston, they don't have access to a second bed, uh, bathroom. A lot of people are sharing bedrooms with family members. So thinking about how that affected everyone during and post COVID or not even post COVID, but post their recovery, during the recovery of COVID. I think that we need a lot more resources into equalizing the healthcare system and the access to the healthcare system. Yeah, I, I think that's such an important point. I think access and use are things that we don't necessarily think of at times. Uh, we have to be reminded to be thinking of them that we're not, as Kelly talked about at the beginning, operating from a productivity model, we're operating from a model of care. And if care is not reaching everyone, you know, why are we doing this, right? So the great, great reflections. Let, let's circle back to Kelly. Kelly, tell me a little bit about what you've learned and what you take away, so, you know, maybe, um, furthering what Kristen said or other thoughts you have? Sure. Um, so one of the big things that I learned was what you think works, and I'm coming from more of an outpatient model here. Um, what you think works may not be necessarily what the general you know, patient population needs. Mm -hmm. So I had to pivot, as we said, to telehealth. And you know that, that was doing really well, but it's crazy to think I actually started a new company while I was in a pandemic because most of the telehealth people that I had, which I thought would be orthopedic, turned out to be more my pregnancy and postpartum women. And, you know, as both Emily uh, had said, is that, and Kristen had said, is that these women, the access to care without feeling uh, with that safety feeling and without feeling compromised was a huge part of the control factor for them because these moms were rock stars. They were pregnant during a pandemic. Their, you know, birthing strategies kind of went out the window. Some couldn't have a support person there. Um, and so giving birth in a pandemic was really tough for them. So to get that piece back, while I had always envisioned this company to be an in, like an in-person hands-on um, role, they told me that this remote telehealth option was was really what they wanted. And that was never really what I wanted to do, but seeing the value in it and seeing how good they felt because they could take control of a situation that really they had no control of was really empowering to me and really rewarding. So that helped me kind of now start to use those strategies after, and I would say after COVID-19, because we're, you know, in a continued new normal, but their strategies that now I can continue to adapt post quarantine. And so I learned a lot about that because you have to roll with the punches. And I always say there's never a problem if you present a solution. So this was a solution that I felt was needed and hopefully can continue with in the future for these women. Yeah, I think that's really, really helpful. Uh, uh, Emily, let's transition to you. Tell me 
uh, tell me about what you think the future will look like, what you'll take away, and maybe what advice you'd give to other practitioners in your field. Yeah, so I mean, I think ways in which I've kind of pivoted throughout, um, I kind of named my pivots because that's, <laughs> I like to create titles for things. That's something that is fun about my job. So my first pivot is called put your mask on first approach. So this is kind of the notion when you're flying with your young child, the flight attendant will say, put your mask on first. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, maybe I didn't do that so much in a, in a given day because when I was at work, that was my mask. <laughs> But now I don't leave my house. So my new mask is, you know, really trying to focus in the early morning hours on myself. So I, I try to work out every day, um, which really, for me, just keeps my mental health kind of at bay. But I also try to spend the early hours writing. And that's something that, um, you know, tends to be a very, uh, something that tends to be pushed to the back burner when you have a lot of these Zoom meetings. So by the time I was ready to help my kids with their Zoom and do it and be there for them after they had had their breakfast, et cetera, I also already felt accomplished. Mm -hmm. um, my second pivot I call transform the norm. So, you know, as researchers, as we're trying to think about ways in which we can be engaging with our human subjects, you know, this has completely changed that. So how can we think about engaging in a different way? So this for my lab has really meant trying to look at artificial intelligence, big data, can moms be sending us videos of their child and can we be learning more using the expertise that we have at Northeastern? Uh, my third pivot is understanding your privilege and trying to do better. So, you know, while this has been completely disruptive to me in my life, um, knowing that I'm extremely lucky as well to have this job that I love that's relatively flexible. Um, my lab has spent a lot of time talking about the inequities between black mothers um, during childbirth and you know, their infant feeding choices and breastfeeding. So we've channeled a lot of that energy toward creating a virtual 5K that we're gonna do in October. Oh. Um, so those have been my pivots, but when I think about the future, I think, again, there's never been a more important time to be in rehab, whether that's a clinician or a scientist. I think conser considerable attention has been paid on the survival rates among patients recovering from COVID, but the next crisis is emerging, and this is the high disability burden of the COVID-19 ICU survivors. And I think this is also paralleled by the fact that the pandemic has had a huge influence on therapy services, technology use, and function for children with special needs. And this is a topic that my colleagues, Danielle Lebeck and Kristen Allison are looking at at Northeastern. And I think as the months go on, we're starting to kind of reshape our labs for the new normal. So, you know, we're finding ways in which we can collect data um, in appropriate ways. We're rethinking conferences to make them more hybrid and accessible. And as Kelly and Kristen said, I think, you know, we're realizing that so much more can be done remotely, which gives us even further reach for our clients and our participants and our students. Mm -hmm. And I kind of want to end my, my, my segment here on the future with a quote from Socrates that I thought really applied here. The secret of change is to focus all of your energy, not on fighting the old, but on building the new. And I think that really needs to be our approach here going forward. Wonderful words to think about there and, and love the reference to gratitude, you know, leading from a, a place of gratitude really helps to strengthen us all. Uh, Kristen, one more question back to you. What would you say to the, the therapists that thought they or students that thought they were going to be acute care therapists, maybe now or not? What's the advice you're going to give them? Or conversely, those that are now being drawn from outpatient and others to come to acute care based on the pandemic. What advice would you have? Give us about 30 seconds as we're getting towards our our question window. You can do it. Honestly, I, 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 I would hope that this hasn't uh, made people shy away from the acute care setting, even though it's scary, to be, to be quite honest. My job didn't change. It changed a lot, but in the same way, I was getting up, going to work the same way as every other day. Um, I loved it. It, is, it was an exciting time, and I think most people in the physical therapy career mm -hmm. are there for... Um, to learn, as we said earlier, and if you're if you're thinking about the acute care setting, you're typically a little bit of kind of an adrenaline junkie, or you're into that kind of intensity, mm -hmm. and it's only going to continue. And there's a lot of work that we can do, and a lot of things that we're seeing with COVID because of the hypercoagulability of these patients. 
there's a lot of research that's going to come out about stroke, post-stroke care after COVID, and we have a lot of work to be done. And this research is only continuing and we're only getting more comfortable with the virus. And I welcome all the new grads into acute care. I think it's a great idea and don't let this kind of keep you away from it. But at the same time, if this wasn't something that you're comfortable with and you, you would like to go into the, the, the outpatient setting, there's obviously no problem with that either. It's whatever you feel like you're most comfortable because the more comfortable you are, the more confident you'll be. And confidence and being a good practitioner go, go hand in hand. Great, great advice. I'm gonna just ask one last question of Kelly and then we'll turn it back over to Nate for some questions from the audience. Uh, you know, we've been talking about women leaders in terms of us as practitioners, right? Or educators. Uh, what about all of the women out there that have COVID? that are going through this, that are gonna be facing some long-term effects that you're encountering as patients. What, what advice do you have for them? Oh, you know, that's a tough one because they've already experienced this life-changing and life-altering um, issue. It's just keep going, is, is you have a strength that you don't know you have. And I think of every life stage because I treat women through all their life stages. And it, what you had as a teenager is different than when you have in your 20s and then if you have children and and going through different stages of life that you have a strength that you don't know exists until you tap into it so i think if you just set a goal and and set smaller goals for yourself and i, and I always say that with my patients as well like i don't start my long-term goals on day one so if you have a goal of getting back to work in a month or then you know starting a new job or starting a new college program whatever age you're at set those small goals first and when you feel that you know adrenaline and dopamine from achieving that then you set your next ones so that you're continually progressing but i think we are way stronger than we give ourselves credit for and i just want to see everybody succeed with that great comment all right, so I'm gonna invite the audience to start typing some questions in the chat if you haven't already, and I'm gonna turn it over to Crosby and Nate. Do we have any questions from the audience you wanna send our way? Hey, Kristen, thanks so much. Um, so our first question is actually from Julie Norton, and um, she writes, what will we see in PT and speech in the coming year with more and more people recovering from COVID? Do you think that we'll see an uptake, an uptick in the need for PTs and speech professionals? Who wants to take that one? Kristen, you want to take that first? Cool. So I think that I, I hope I know that there's some uh, a lot coming out in terms of new uh, outpatient reimbursement rates is is tough right now where where they're looking in in the Medicare field of of cutting by a significant amount in terms of reimbursement. But I do find think that there's going to be a huge need for PT in the future and of course speech as well, OT. These patients are coming out with, with prolonged disability that, that we've never seen before. Uh, I think it's gonna be very interesting as a very young therapist, I'm, I'm curious as to how this affects when this, this population who is post COVID ages, what's gonna happen with their O2 requirements with age as the natural aging process. A lot of people develop COPD and and other sort of obstructive or restrictive diseases, what are we going to do with that information? Um, I think there's going to be a lot of patients already are, are needing more outpatient therapies post um, ICU stay. And a lot of research even before COVID was coming out in terms of the post ICU syndrome that they're finding where there's a lot of cognitive disabilities. So we need to get speech and uh, occupational therapy as well as PT involved in the cognitive rehab. Um, the prolonged um, decreased endurance. We need a lot of outpatient therapies in that situation. And I think from an, it's, it's a little different from an acute care setting, uh, but we are seeing patients with, with um, coming back into the hospital with strokes, very young patients. I've had, I've had patients as young as their early 20s coming back with, with acute strokes. So we're, we have to kind of completely shift how we approach these patients because their endurance and their activity tolerance is so low that our rehab process has to shift appropriately too. And I, I see a, another question in the chat, Crosby, if it's okay that I go to this because I think it stems on what Kristen's saying and, and uh, Kelly and Emily, if you can um, 
uh, add in here. What about evidence-based practice, right? So we're so used to, and I'm paraphrasing the question from Kristen Alley, uh, Allison, we're so used to basing our decisions on our patients' circumstances, our instincts, and evidence-based practice, and now we're doing things without the evidence in front of us, right? So, so Emily, you live in evidence-based practice. Kelly, you practice evidence-based practice. What should we do from here? I mean, I think the quick dissemination of clinical practices, practices and research procedures are key. So, um, you know, I've been on, I'm on a planning board for an upcoming meeting that focuses on swallowing. And one of the uh, speaking series that we're going to, to include is just how everyone around the world is treating COVID. So it's not only the discrepancies maybe between, you know, Kristen and Kelly or me and Kristen, you know, in, a, in the same town, you know, or, or in neighboring towns. We're also treating COVID very differently in different countries with different healthcare access. Um, and I think that the dissemination and the unification on, you know, a small level, a town level, a state level, and then on a national level, and then across the nations, I think is really important and key. And as far as research, again, getting those quick findings out, there's mm -hmm. been research avenues that have allowed, you know, calls for grants on this topic or calls for papers on this exact small niche area of the aerodigestive swallowing respiration. And I think that, you know, to, to the earlier comment, I think that um, Kristen brought up a really great point that we have these people who've been on ventilators for a really long time. They're going to have persistent respiratory voice swallowing issues. We kind of know that's going to happen as far as the sequence of getting off of a, of a ventilator. But you also have this group of almost typical COVID patient survivors, you know, so who aren't going to be that group. And I think that is really where we're going to see the change in our practice because we're not sure really what to do with these individuals um, because it's so different than what we're used to treating. Great yeah, if I could just interject with that, um, exactly what Emily had said is that we have to adapt to the research coming out, you know, to use the overly used term of it's a fluid situation where research comes out every month, every day, you know, metrics come out. So as a practitioner, we have to rely on the, the data and then our experience on how to apply that data too. So, and then to touch back um, a little bit on what Kristen said of how, you know, what PT, what it's gonna look like is that I, I call myself because I am a solo practitioner and you know, I've been practicing for many years. I almost call myself like a primary care practitioner where I think PT, especially in the outpatient world, we're going to have to become a multi-systemic. We're going to have to have education that isn't primarily to outpatient anymore. It needs to go over all the different systems that are affected by COVID and then how we apply those to our patient that's you know, in front of us because the comorbidities that are happen happening that are changing every month on the research coming out um, it changes how we treat and changes how we practice. So I think the educational piece um, in the future of PT will broaden. And, and I think that's for the better. Mm, great, great takeaways. Crosby, what other questions do we have? I see so many, I've lost track. <laughs> going I was to gonna say, yeah. yeah, thanks so much. We've got some really thoughtful <laughs> questions in here. So next up we have um, a question from Moira Mannix Vitell about co-op and her question is, um, I'm wondering what thoughts you would share with our co-op students, some of who have just started their first co-ops and some of whom will be starting in the next few weeks. What advice would you give them as they enter the healthcare setting at this unique time? Great question. Who wants to take that one? So I, I know we, Go ahead, Kristen, yeah. <laughs> so we actually, we have a co-op student now um, and I think it's, it's a, you're, you're very lucky. I, I would, and it sounds weird to say to be if you're working in a clinic or or possibly putting yourself to be honest at risk of developing a, a or getting a virus but you're at the front lines you are learning on the fly in a way that it's totally different and i think it's it's adding a lot of strength um to our profession because it's one thing to study a, a disease and then become proficient in it and then become completely an expert in it, but none of us are experts in this right now. And I think seeing that process, especially with more um, more seasoned therapists, you'll see the thought process. And a lot, most of us in the office are 
are talking out loud. It's what did you see? How did you see that? What did you do about it? And seeing that kind of collaboration that occurs very frequently in the acute care setting where we have a, a difficult patient that we've never seen this, especially at Boston Medical Center, we have patients from all over the world being flying in to, to come to us because we are a safety net hospital. And you get to see that collaboration occur. And I think that um, that's something that's not frequently necessarily talked about in the, in the, in the healthcare we, uh, world, but how much we need to rely on each other and that interdisciplinary care, it's a very unique opportunity for co-op students to see that conversation happen in real time. I think that's a great takeaway about being on the front lines. I think, you know, my, my son's coming here to Northeastern and people, he's coming in a couple of weeks as a first year student and people say, you're going to let him go to, you're going to let him go to campus during COVID. You're going to let him, you know, go on classes and participate. And it's the same thing, you know, Northeastern knows we want people here on our front lines of education, right? We want you to get the experience and do it in that safety net of collaborative care. So great, great advice for the co-op students. Crosby, what else do we have going on in the chat? So I'm going to jump around a little bit because we have a question from Rachel Nolan that's kind of uh, the converse of the prior question, which is um, for students who may not currently have the ability to be working with patients, mm -hmm. what advice do you have for ways for them to become more involved with the current movement to best help contribute to the field right now? Yeah, great question. There's so many students that we have here still looking for clinical placements because they can't get them and across the country. So what advice would all of you have? Um, I can start just by from a more of a research perspective and uh, hi, Rachel. She was one of my students in the past. <laughs> um, you're doing well. Um, yeah, so it, a lot of the different journals, particularly for our field of speech, have um, kind of the state of the art right now in COVID. So uh, you know, I'm part of the swallowing or dysphagia world. And, you know, they, they have been really been on their webpage and, and through their journals been releasing, you know, every month, like what is the current state of COVID, right? As far as aerodigestive, um, respiratory swallowing voice, that type of, those types of outcomes. And then um, I would look to your professional, like ASHA or the American Speech and Hearing Association, I'm sure PT has their own, but each of these different kind of organizations has statements and links and places where you can kind of keep on the front line of research. Um, and then, you know, you know, we're doing the best as far as the training of students remotely or telehealth or, you know, looking at various case studies. Um, but I think that looking at the research in that way or in keep, keeping kind of up to date on the front lines is, is a good way to start. Yeah, keep on learning. I think, you know, one of the things that happened during the pandemic transition is people from all over Northeastern were emailing me, I'll be a, I will be a fake patient for you. Let me know what we can do for telehealth. I think it's a good reminder to the audience and others that if you have the ability to kind of help others take students, please let us know. We can utilize them in all of our clinical, clinical professions because we want to continue to graduate our frontline providers on time. So, so great question. Yeah, I, just to interject with that, I've had a couple of just random cold calls, too, that are therapy students in my community that have just emailed me and said, hey, can I come and observe? And if that's not available to observe just by either regulations or not able to get there, there is that remote piece that if somebody's willing to tap into, that you can treat a patient with me. Um, you know, I offered to, to have somebody with consent from the patient on a FaceTime, a Zoom, a Google Meet while I'm treating this woman. And to see that sort of in-person interaction remotely, it's a very easy email. So just reach out, reach out to, to what you're interested in, where I have a very specific specialty. So, you know, to be able to tap into those resources that you might not normally see, especially with you know, I have two uh, women who developed COVID nine months pregnant and then delivered and they weren't sure if they could, you know, actually go through the delivery and then seeing their recovery afterwards and the differences, it, it's a really cool thing to be able to tap into that, that remote part. So I hope also the legislation allows us to keep doing that as well because different states have reciprocity. So hopefully that progresses um, as well in that our, our um, APTA and services help that along. Great points, great points. Uh, Crosby, I see one more question in the chat, if it's okay if, if we answer this one. There's some questions about research being done or planned to be done. 
uh, on post-COVID uh, physical recovery. So I'm going to ask Emily about this in a minute because I know you mentioned one study already with uh, Dr. Levesque and Dr. Allison. Uh, the, Bouvet is, is working on a lot of different initiatives of, called the Translate Center, where we're working on joining together with our partners through data science, our partners in, in computer science and technology and others to start working on some of these solution, solutions more broadly post-COVID. So I think there's going to be a lot coming out from, from Bouvet specifically and the university on that in the near future. Let's put a little plug to keep, keep listening to Bouvet and keep being involved. Emily, can you answer further on that one? Yeah, I mean, I think as far as kind of the research post-COVID, I mean, now it, all research will be post-COVID. You know, so now everyone we're interacting with, it, we're not dealing with this, like everyone is kind of at the extreme of, of their function, right? So, you know, I think when we think of the mental health, I also have another research study with Rachel Rogers and Applied Psych looking at um, the access to food and the food choices surrounding being quarantined and being at home because, you know, we really did drastically change how we eat and how we feed our young children. So, um, you know, I think the research post-COVID um, and, and we're technically not post-COVID, we're during COVID. So, you know, comparing periods before, during, after, I'm a part of a larger environmental health group where we're really looking at really small details of stress before, during, and after. And, you know, the stress is going to be on mother-child interactions. You know, there's so many psychosocial, um, in addition to physiological changes. So I think the research questions are numerous. Um, and I think Bouvet is really taking the lead. So that's very exciting. Great, great. Well, it's hard to believe, but we're almost at the end of our time. I'm going to ask each of our participants, let's go to Kristen first to just give a, a 30 second closing remark, if you don't mind. Well, I think what we've all kind of focused on here is we can do it. I think it's it's very frequent that women in healthcare and women in general think we kind of take the the back the back seat of some things um, in order to as as Emily had said in order to to make everything work. Uh, but we are at the front lines, and we need to be confident in the fact that we have a voice. And I think it's very important to to use that confidence in a positive way and I like I said at the beginning I did not ever picture myself really as a leader I am not the most confident person to be quite honest and and you you grow into it and the fact that I'm such a young therapist and you just had to make it work that's what all of us did and and we came out the other side so far into the kind of middle ground I don't want to jinx it obviously with everything going on and the numbers up ticking a little bit but you just, you, you can do anything you put your mind to and don't let the idea of being perfect get in, get in the way of being good. So. Thank you, Kristen. Kelly. Thank you, thank you for having me. I know this has been great. I, I just want to encourage everybody to continue to grow our profession because we make changes every single day and we have strengths that we can tap into that and perspectives that no one else has because you know, we can go through different um, professions and go through different research. And, and I, I just feel like we have a voice, like Kristen said, and we want to, we want that voice heard. And we want it heard in a way that is empowered too. So let's just keep growing the profession and be the best we can be. Great words, great inspiration. Emily, what about you? Yeah, I guess I would just say, of course, we can all do this and we can all do hard things. We can persevere through this but also to remember to be kind to yourself. It's okay to take a day on the couch. It's okay to have those mental health breaks. Um, and to know that some days are going to be rough. Some days you're very inspirational and not all days are the same because it's so ever changing. So just to be kind to yourself and your colleagues, because I think we forget that we're all going through kind of different pandemics too. You know, my pandemic is different than your pandemic. And I think when we're particularly engaging with our students in the fall, you know, we've all gone through such different um, experiences. And so just to really be kind at the end of the day and to realize, you know, everyone again is doing the best we can, but again, continue to drive and persevere through this. And, uh, you know, thank you to everyone who's on the front line um, doing all the hard work. So thank you. Well, thank you. This has been just a wonderful hour. I'm inspired. I want to make sure we thank Bouvet College for initiating this Women Who Inspire series. This is the last of the series. Special thank you to Crosby and to Nate O'Connell and um, 
and Julie Norton for their assistance with this process. Um, I wanna thank all of the attendees that have attended this um, today, as well as the past and continue to be involved with us, continue to help us to make Bouvet and our students and our alumni and our future and current frontline providers the best that they can be. So thank you everybody. I hope everyone stays well. Bye-bye.